Hi, I'm Phil Ashey from the American Anglican Council, and it is our great pleasure to introduce this video resource series on the 2019 Book of Common Prayer. Now, I want to get things straight from the very beginning. This here is the Bible. It is our ultimate standard of faith and practice and belief. Everything comes under the authority of the Bible, including the new 2019 Book of Common Prayer. Now, what's the difference and, and how do these things work together? Well, let me tell you a story from my own growing up. When I was a teenager and I was in a wonderful Episcopal church and youth group that, that believed in the Bible and in Jesus, I came away from that experience, having grown up in the uh, Episcopal church, saying, you know, all I need is a Bible and a guitar and some contemporary worship songs. And man, that's church, that's it, that's worship. And then I went to this Anglo-Catholic church with icons of the Virgin Mary and votive candles and acolytes and subdeacons and incense. And it's like the Lord lifted a veil and helped me to see we were doing liturgy out of the 1928 Book of Common Prayer. And I realized, you know, the Book of Common Prayer actually has a lot of the Bible in it. Not only does it have a lot of the Bible in it, it's full of the Bible and it points you to the Bible like no other worship books I've ever seen in my entire life. It breathes, it points, it immerses you in the Bible and helps us as a people follow Jesus in a biblical way so that his words and the words of God inspired in this great book uh, shape us, as the colic says. We read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them. We become more like Jesus. Now, I know some of you have heard people say, and some of you may have said from time to time, hey, why do we have to have formal liturgical prayers? Why not something just spontaneous and from the heart? Because isn't that more authentic? And what I want to say to you, right from page four in the preface to this 2019 Book of Common Prayer, that Cranmer's uh, prayer book, the way that he was committed in the Reformation to putting uh, the prayers and uh, the scriptures in the words of the common people have lasted 500 years and uh, are in this time of great global reformation for Anglicans and Christians all over the world, a way that we can hear and receive anew in these great words that have been written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Ways that we can pray, ways that we can think about God, ways that we can adore Him. From Recife, Brazil, to Lango Diocese in Uganda, all over the world. This Cranmerian prayer book is what's shaping the belief, the worship, and the obedience to Jesus of Anglicans all over the world. The, the wonderful thing about a Book of Common Prayer is common means common in two different ways. Common in that it's a language of prayer that all of us share um, as, as Anglicans. And it's also common in that all of us can do it. It's not just for uh, the clergy. It's not just for those who have been highly trained. It's designed for everybody to be able to pick up and join in the prayers of the church. I'm Andrea Millard and I am on staff at Church of the Ascension and I've been involved in the prayer book for, I don't know, probably four or five years. One of the things that um, a prayer book helps us do is pray daily, pray throughout the day. And when we pick it up, we find um, our relationship with God growing. Um, we find it because we are saying similar prayers um, day after day, week after week, year after year. It's grounding for us. It's spiritually grounding because, you know, some days you get up in the morning and you don't feel like praising the Lord. And when you go to the prayer book, it gives you words to praise the Lord, even though you may not feel like it. To me, the prayer book is priming the pump for my relationship with God. So in season or out of season, the prayer book is there as a tool. It's also great for um, framing your family life or the life with your friends and your community. Because when you come together, no matter what is going on, there are prayers that are going to address your situation in life. Because we think of the Anglican experience and part of the 
whole Christian church's experience is that, um, that things repeated, verses of scripture repeated, songs of scripture repeated, prayers repeated, actually go deep in the consciousness um, of the people. In fact, especially that's so with children. Uh, folks know as parents uh, that their children can rehearse bedtime stories. It doesn't take them long at all. And if you change any detail, <laughs> they get ravingly angry. It gives you this language, it gives you this way of, that, that goes deep and that, that, that um, carries all through, through your life. John McCain, uh, who was of course Senator from uh, Arizona, he was known as the chaplain of the Hanoi Hilton, the, the prison in Hanoi. Why was he the chaplain? Because he went to an Episcopal high school. The prayers were said over and over. They were drilled into him. And so he knew them all. And without any books, without the Bible, without any, he could re rehearse what he knew from the repetitions of high school. One of my colleagues spoke to the fact that this, uh, this point in history gives us the chance uh, to draw together several different Anglican bodies who had sort of fractured over the years for different reasons. Um, this is one of the points in church history where we actually get the joy of seeing fewer denominations at the end of the day than there were at the beginning. Um, but part of the challenge of that is that many of these different Anglican bodies had come to use um, their own particular version of the prayer book over the years. When the Anglican Church in North America was formed, it was pretty obvious that we couldn't just pick or favor any one of those prayer books, but we had to work together to come up with a, a prayer book that would be faithful enough to the classic historic Anglican tradition that we would all want to, to buy in and use this. From the very beginning, from the first prayer books, uh, the attempt was to bring the whole nation together uh, that was the English context, of course, at the Reformation, to bring the whole nation together with a common way of praying. And so you took the, the faith once delivered uh, and you tried to put it in the language of the people. Um, and, and, and indeed, the prayer books from the beginning have done a fairly good job of holding all these emphases within the Christian faith um, together whether it was uh, the Catholic tradition from the earliest church, or it was reformed truth uh, at the Reformation, uh, or in subsequent uh, centuries, uh, the, the, the Pentecostal uh, emphasis. I mean, it first shows up with the Wesleyans in the 18th century. Again, a prayer book that all of them can use. Every age uh, needs a prayer book uh, in, in terms of offering the, the, the prayers and praises of the people. Circumstances change. The, cultural context changes, uh, though the faith doesn't change. We came to understand that there were four uh, values or characteristics uh, that would interplay as we made our decisions. Uh, the first one uh, was continuity. Um, it had to be continuous on the whole Christian tradition and particularly continuous on uh, what Anglicans uh, had always believed and how Anglicans had always prayed. Uh, secondly, memorability. Uh, this tradition is one that depends on uh, the repetition of um, uh, of scriptural sentences, the repetition of prayers, uh, the repetition of scripture songs uh, as a way to go deep within uh, within the faithful um, before too long. I mean, even children can repeat um, the comfortable words. Uh, the third principle was um, uh, musicality or poetry, a, a way of expression that with the fewest words said the most possible things. Uh, and the final piece was clarity, um, that it needed to be understandable to people. One of the uh, one of the 39 articles at the Reformation was that, 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 that worship should be in the language of the people. Well, the 21st century way of using uh, language is a little different than the, uh, than the 16th century way. There were some things that immediately struck me, and I've learned so much about our church, the Anglican Church in North America. The, the committee that was put together um, was really diverse, people from all sorts of different backgrounds, and the thing that struck me immediately was the deference given to the other person. Uh, um, there'd be somebody from an Anglo-Catholic background would say to the evangelical, how does that strike you? It, and it wasn't encamping into our various opinions. And it was clear to me right there that, that our church is, although more theologically cohesive and, and we all affirm the Lordship of Jesus Christ in a way that we can rejoice, we're coming from very different places. We're coming from different prayer books. We're coming from different traditions. 
And so um, one of the joys in this prayer book, one of the unique things about this prayer book is that participatory feedback mechanism um, that the internet in the modern technological age has allowed us. So um, whether it's clergy and laity from all over the church would write in and say, this prayer means a lot to me. Could you find a way? Um, or, you know, you, you missed the mark on this and, um, and, and this really doesn't work for us. And so it would come to us, we would take every single one of those comments and then um, we would do our best shot at it. We would send it up to a bishop's review panel and then it would go on to the College of Bishops. But that process, that iterative process has left us with something w which could have been a platypus. It could have been a bunch of different pieces put together to make a weird animal, but really I believe has made a, a beautiful swan of a thing um, that has found the, the beautiful parts of all of the, the different parts of Anglicanism, the, the, the different expressions, and brought them together in one place and, and something that's usable for the low churchman and the high churchman, whatever those terms mean, and the Anglo-Catholic and the evangelical and the charismatic. Um, so this prayer book it sits, I think, unique in the, in, on the shelf of prayer books in that it is something that was a creation not of a small committee, not of a, on a particular group of the church, but of the whole church. Uh, in many ways, it's a synthesis of all the things that Anglicans have always believed and the way Anglicans have always prayed with the best parts of the liturgical renewal of the second half of the 20th century. The things represented in all the modern prayer books from 1979 in the United States to our modern service, the prayer book um, in Kenya, for instance. Um, because it's a synthesis, the new um, ways of understanding and of ecumenical consensus of the last 50 years um, with the Anglican tradition, I suspect that this prayer book will be very significant for the whole Anglican world.